let's just give the Lord a shout. You know, if we really know what we have and the privilege that we have to find ourselves in a place where we have the grace to accept Jesus into our lives, to acknowledge that the Almighty is God and to have the wisdom of submission to God. Because we're in it, it's so easy to be comfortable and take it for granted. It's when you see people that are so lost in themselves and in the life and the world that they live in that they will argue with everything against the existence of God and the power of God when you see their confidence in their foolishness and the ease with which you can be in that state is when you will know that to somehow be in a place where you can come to an acceptance of God and have a personal relationship with him that allows you to freely submit your life into his hands and accept his word without feeling stupid. Because if you sit in some of the places I sit, and you walk through some of the places I walk across the face of the earth. If you don't really know who you are in Christ, or you don't really have an understanding of God, you would want to bury him and be ashamed. Because too much power, too much position, too much education, too much opportunity makes it so easy to say, who is God? It's true. I remember one time was Pastor that sent us, myself and two other pastors from Fountain. We went to preach in a church in America. And we were sharing with them about the great things that God was doing. Testimonies of greatness, of different things. And I remember a woman asked and said, you know, how can we have those kind of of testimonies here. I looked at her and I said, you know, it's actually more difficult for you. Why? When you touch your switch, what do you expect? Once you touch the switch, you expect that power will come on. You've never had to pray for Nepa. When you get on the road, you're not worried about your car running into a speed bump or into pothole or some there's some things you don't even have to pray for so in a way you get to a place of complacence where you are first an american you believe in your government you believe in your system you believe in everything being available before you remember there's a god and so they don't get to test the power of God. Why am I starting here? I'm not even sure because that's not what I plan. Let me tell you something. So that you will know that the ways of God are purely his. He's totally in control. And there's a reason for everything and everywhere that we find ourselves. So you can stop being allowed to despise being a Nigerian. You can stop... Hating that I come from this country. I wish I come from where? Tell me, where? Would you like Trump to be your president right now? Would you like to be British in the midst of the total confusion that they have? Would you like to be consumed by bombs or confusion or whatever? I have traveled the earth. And every t far, the farther I go, the more I am grateful. For being a Nigerian. Oh, there are many things I like from each of those countries. There are many things, but I'll have to pick from each one all together to get my perfect world. And then I wouldn't need God. 
So I want you to understand the needs of our lives, the imperfections around us have a role and they have a lesson. And like that American woman, it was difficult for them to test the word of God and see the results, the true efficacy of his word. It was more difficult for them to bring the word of God to life because the solutions of men around them have worked so readily that they don't get as much opportunity to see the hand of God. So even that is a privilege. So I want you to know that we are blessed. There are many things that are blessings in our lives that the world makes us think that they're worth nothing. So whatever else you take away from here or from this conference, that you have the wisdom and the understanding to come into the house of God as a child of God in submission to your God to accept his will and his power and to surrender yourself in his service day by day. That is a privilege. That's more than enough for you to thank the Lord for. And for that alone, you will not lose your reward. Amen. That's the truth. You will not. Because you know when the chips are down and we break it all down, you'll be surprised that the things that you think are the real things you're looking for, they're not worth much. Many houses, good for you. How many can you live in? And even if you live in one and the rest are generating money for you every day, one day you will die. Somebody else will take over those houses. You will have no clue whether they were sold for peanuts or they were used for the wrong reasons. And you'd have labored all your life for those things. For what? Oh, so you can buy all the most beautiful cars. Trust me. I have cars, but every time you get a new one, every other one becomes liability in your parking space. Why? Because you will find that you rarely use them as much as you did before. So what does that tell you? You don't need that many. That is the truth. They become very expensive assets that you just pack. I remember one day somebody saying to me that, you know, when you have house, you have apartments or houses in England and you just lock it up for when you go there for two days, for three days, or when you're there for a week, they're 365 weeks in a year. So if you're in England for 10 weeks of the year, no, they're 365 days and 52 weeks, right? Assuming you're in England for 10 weeks of the year, which is tough if you're living in Nigeria. But assuming you're there for 10 weeks, there are 42 other weeks that you're not. What do you have? A very expensive wardrobe. Because that whole apartment, for whatever it's worth, you've just turned it into a wardrobe for holding your clothes locked up, unused. That's the truth. So break down the many things you think you want and you will realize that the most important things, how you feel, what gives you joy, what brings you peace, what excites you, what keeps you focused, what allows you to sleep at night without fear, what gives you confidence of expression, the joy of blessing or being a blessing, those things you cannot buy. So be careful what you think you want or what you think you, you don't have, which is why you despise this, your country, or despise your father, or despise this and that, and why God is not doing... Shh, shh. Think. That's not my message for today, but somehow that's where we started. God bless you. Have a seat. Deserve the glory and the honor. So we lift our hands in worship as we bless your holy name.
Kojumatini Muyo oh, Baba Kojumatini speak Yoruba it's one of my favorite songs for now and it just simply means that the Lord that watches my back that I may never be ashamed that I worship him it's that simple the reason I can have the courage and the confidence to walk the face of the earth without fear or favor is that there's a God that walks 24-7 365 days of the year every minute at work watching my back to ensure that I will never be ashamed, nor will I ever be disgraced. That even when I miss it and I fall, I fall into his hands. Caught by him. That when the world thinks, now she's missed it, he says, don't worry. You know how your thing reroutes you immediately. He immediately reroutes me through from the error point to the place of glory. That's why... I cannot imagine the madness of a man or a woman that says there is no God. That's just the truth. So, you know, when I heard this song sometime of recent, I just thought, gosh, it just went somewhere in my spirit. I didn't even know it. That's all I know. Just that spot. But I sing it to myself over and over and over and over and over again. Because I know that as long as he's got my back, God help the competitors. God help anybody that's standing in my way. God help anything that seeks to stop me. God help anything or any powers that gang up against me. Why? Because I've got the king of kings. He's got me fully covered on all flanks. Fully covered. That no matter what happens... The word, all things work together for my good, will forever be true. And I will never be ashamed. The Bible says, they that know their God, they shall be strong and they will do exploits. They that put their trust in the Lord, they will not be ashamed. That's simply what that song is. Matini lehi, koju matini, Father, Lord, we bless you. Father, we give you praise. We give you worship. We give you honor. We adore you. We testify that you alone, you are God. This day we have gathered unto you, not unto any man. You are the source of knowledge yourself, Father. And today we have come to drink from your fountain of knowledge. Teach us, O oh Lord. Guide us, O oh Lord. Open our eyes to see that which we must know today. For the future that is laid before us. Grant us grace, wisdom, understanding, knowledge, favor, all that is required, Lord, to walk in excellence for the glorification of your name. We worship you, Father. Bless this house, O oh Lord. Bless the man and the woman of the house. Bless every Aaron and all in this house. 
everyone that is part of holding their hands to fulfill the assignment and the purpose of this house. Be exalted in this house, always. May they never get to a place where they say, who is their God? Forever, let every man that walks in here with a situation walk out with a solution. Thank you, Father. Blessed be your holy name as I yield myself as a vessel. I speak with the tongue of the learned and I speak with a tongue that cannot be resisted. Fill my mouth, Lord, as I open it and let your word bless your people. Thank you, Father. For in Jesus' name I have prayed. Amen. Amen. I've had a crazy... I think I've been away since last year. Well, it meant I left on the 29th, but it's last year. I only came back this week and started running from the moment I got in. And I came back with this cold that was just stubborn. And I never pay attention to anything that seeks to stand in the way of my plans. So I just continued my life. The cold itself would have to find its way out. You know, and um, I have this ministration and another one today, and I have to fly tonight. So I, I guess this morning, I got the timing a bit wrong. One hour difference between the real time and my own time in my head. So I apologize for coming late. Now, my message is about excellence. But we're going to split my time into two parts. I'm going to have a conversation. I'm going to share some thoughts, but we're going to have a conversation. Because one of the things I've learned is in church, there's a lot of speaking to. And I have found in my experience, there must be a lot of speaking together because it makes all the difference. So you don't come in, listen, and walk away with questions, no. I want you to walk away with answers and understanding. Because sometimes without the understanding, the information is useless. And a lot of people go to church, collect information day in, day out. But there's no understanding of how to apply it. So they're still stuck where they were. And they don't make use of it. That's a waste of your time and my time. And I don't like wasting time. So I like to be sure that what I apply my time to yields results that is useful. So when we're talking about excellence, I could go very biblical and we'll be here for the rest of the day because there are loads of scriptures in the Bible that tells you about the attitude of excellence. And your biggest example is probably Daniel, even though you will find many people across the Bible that are great examples of doing things in a particular way. I think Paul was a great example of that. In his days of not knowing God, he was excellent at doing everything he understood to be right. You know, he was diligent in being wrong. And that's why, you know, it's a gift and a grace to actually be right in Christ. Because you can be like a Paul and be diligent in being wrong. And when he then found the truth, he was super diligent in carrying that message to the ends of the earth. So when you look at examples like that, and you look at Daniel in the courts of the kings, the many kings that he served in, and that's a message for you, that when you walk in excellence, you will serve with many kings if you yourself do not even rule as a king. Because you know, depends on what you classify as a king. If you're the MD of First Bank, you're a king, but you still have a chairman and a board. So that's like a Daniel. You're a leader in your own authority and in your own right. But there was still a king of Babylon in the land. But it's irrelevant. What we're talking about is not about whether you have become the MD, the ED, the chief executive of your company or whatever. No. It's about you day by day, hour by hour, in the life that you live, having a mindset and an attitude 
that seeks to do whatsoever you do at whatever point in your life. To do it in a way that there's something to see in the way you do it. To do it in a way that someone can learn something from how you do it. To do it in a way that shows that you have applied the best of yourself to the assignment of the moment. If you are a cleaner that cleans diligently, you're just a cleaner. But you're a cheerful, friendly, non-grudging cleaner. People walk into the office in the morning. You're already there at the time you expected. They see that at the sign, oh, I think this, oh, I'm so sorry, ma. You clean, good morning, ma, how are you? You're cheerful, you're friendly, you're warm. You're dedicated to your trade, no matter how menial. Because it's not about the trade. It's not about the position. It's not about the title. The Bible says, show me a man that is diligent in his ways. It didn't say, show me a man that is diligent as a king. He will rule. He will dine with kings. He will be lifted to the highest places. Why? Because your diligence in the place of your assignment will always be a key for opening the door to higher assignments or opportunities. So being excellent is it's life. It's you morning, afternoon, and night. It's you every day doing whatever you do, no matter who is watching. Why? Because the Bible says everything that we do, we should do as what? As unto the Lord. So there's always somebody watching. The guy watching never sleeps, nor slumber. And the service of your life and mine is unto him and no one else. That's your biggest check for why you must do things well. Because in your service of the master, how do you want to be rated? You're serving an invisible God whose standards are beyond measure. Who does not only measure the physical results that men see. Because, you know, I can cook up the results for men to see. But I might hate the man that I work for. And do high service when he's around. An excellent spirit requires consistency, commitment, dedication, integrity, whether it's morning, afternoon, and night. With an excellent spirit, it doesn't mean you'll always be right. It just means even when you're wrong, you'll be sincerely wrong, diligently. You'll apply yourself to do the best of something, even though you're doing it the wrong way, based on the limitation of your knowledge. And in that moment, help always comes. When you find people who genuinely want to serve, who genuinely want to please, who genuinely want to do things right, but have limitations. Even you cannot ignore the heart condition with which they do what they do. Because it's a spirit. It's the spirit of action. It's an applicable attitude. It's not a skill. Because some men have excellent skills but are not excellent. They're two separate things. You can be a fantastic carpenter, but a non-excellent worker. 
Do you understand what I'm saying? You have the skills. When you choose to apply yourself, you will deliver the most beautiful piece of furniture. However, there's a guy with a reasonable skill who is diligent in applying himself and his limited skill to produce furniture. Who needs more time to deliver what you can deliver in less time? But because you will not even apply yourself in any time, he will ultimately deliver better peace and more pieces than the guy with the excellent skill. And that's why you find some people you went to school with, they have first class. How many people know people like that? But they haven't had it up to much. They haven't quite achieved much. Who knows someone like that? Because they're naturally smart. So it's through no effort on their side that they can do well academically. They just have a, maybe as they listen, they pick. Someone else needs three, four hours reading the same thing to pick. But he will apply the three, four hours and he'll be more diligent in applying himself to the examination. And the one who has the natural ability takes it for granted and doesn't do as much. And then even if they then get to work together, same place, admitted into First Bank on the same day, one shows character, diligence, commitment, can be trusted, can be relied on to consistently deliver value over time. When it gets to promotion, who do you think will move forward? The second guy. So it's not about skill. As an employer of labor today, I will employ for character and teach you the skills. It's true. If you have the skills, but you have the wrong attitude, and you don't have that commitment and diligence, and an excellent spirit that seeks to deliver the best of yourself, or apply the best of yourself to achieve the best result for the assignment, you're poisonous to my system. Because you will teach other people to become like that. And because they know you are smart, they will follow you. So you have the power of influence, but negative influence. So it's not about skills. Why? Because I can always teach you skills. You can always learn skills. It's about how you view things. Your ability to stay true to your values. Your ability to stay true to the assignment. Your ability to consistently pursue the goal and stay committed. I have a good story to tell, but I can't sit down long enough to write the book. My friend has an average story to tell, but if she's diligent in sitting and writing and correcting and editing and rewriting, as she's doing that, she will get help. Somebody will say, ah, you know, you can improve this by this because at least she has put down what she has in her mind. The help will help her to improve what she wants to write. And eventually, she will get more books to the market than I will. Are we communicating? Because you're rather quiet. So I, I want you to understand it's not that I'm going to lay hands on you and you'll have an excellent spirit. You're a child of God. The Holy Spirit that dwells on the inside of you is already an enabler. But faith without works is nothing. It's useless. 
You can believe from today till tomorrow. If you don't get up and do what you need to do, you will starve. Because the Bible says that a man that does not work, should not eat. You know, we cause confusion in the church a lot with our emotional compassion. People that we should allow to stay hungry so they can get up and fulfill purpose. We feed them away from purpose. You're laughing. It's true. Because half the time we don't even pray about people that we help. Somebody just says, I need help. Okay, fine. Why should somebody who cannot afford a private school put a child in a private school and come begging for school fees from you every term? That's a problem. Because, you know, we get confused about all of these things. That's not how God works. Apply the best of yourself and do the work. What does it mean? It means that the school you can afford for your child, that the Lord knows that without stealing, that's what you can afford, that you will help that child to learn the best that child can, even as you're praying through for wisdom for that child. <coughs> that the level of teacher you can afford as assistance to support that child, that even that will not stop that child from fulfilling purpose. <coughs> Sorry. Because the Bible says, haven't done what? It, it didn't say, haven't done more than you can afford to do. <coughs> God is not going to come and ask you for what he hasn't given you. Sorry, the cold knows that, cold or not, I will go about my father's business. So that's why I will not call you to say, oh, I'm sorry. I can't speak. My throat is hurting. You better hurt and preach. <coughs> because I already gave my word a long time ago, and I always keep it. In reality, we need to understand the fundamentals of how we live an excellent life. It's not about you becoming somebody else. It's not about you trying to take on the talent of another to be yours. Because you will keep running, you will never catch up. This is the truth. It's about you <coughs> coming to an acceptance or a knowledge of who you are in Christ. What your strengths are. What are the gifts you have been given? Now, with your gift, there are opportunities for enhancement. Because the Bible says we must seek what? Seek knowledge. In seeking knowledge, the Bible says we must seek understanding. So you must always seek knowledge to improve yourself, to enhance yourself, to empower yourself to be able to do all. Because he says, having done all, stand. He says, having done more than you can do. As you do your all, everything that you need, the Lord will bring your way. That might be help. That might be other people. That might be other people's talent added to lift up your hand. But the Bible also says, the Lord is what? Your glory and the lifter of your head. And in lifting your head, he doesn't physically come to do it. He sets you on a path lined with people that will lift your hand and lift you up. But guess 
how you attract most of those people to you. It's in excellently and diligently deploying to the extent of your own talent in the place of your opportunity or opening. Manifesting character, a person that can be trusted. Manifesting diligence, a person that consistently does what they need to do when they should do it or goes beyond the call of duty. Manifesting grace. And showing love. Because you are not that smart person that everybody runs away from. You know, some people are like crazy professors. You know he's brilliant, but just keep out of his way. He's a madman. They keep him at the back in the lab. Nobody wants to talk to him. So in an organization, what happens to a guy like that? He will never become the CEO. Why? The CEO position requires interacting with human beings. And a person like that should be kept behind. You find a place where he works only with computers and stuff and doesn't deal with human beings. He cannot even be the head of a department. Why? He cannot supervise people. He's good. He's smart. They will keep him because they need his raw skills. But he will never lead. <coughs> or be promoted to the highest level because he lacks an excellent spirit that involves interacting, relating, building, encouraging, and leading others. You can't run a business if you can't deal with people. Why? Except if the employee is you by yourself and yourself. And any business that requires only you will never go anywhere. It's not a magic. You don't need a miracle to have an excellent spirit. You need the Holy Spirit and you have it as long as you're born again. And if you're not, come out now. Let's settle that. So that you can give your life to Christ. You can receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we will know that you have what you need. And thereafter, you will pursue in stages as you move. You know, God is a wise God. <clears throat> it will test your hand for a place before opening the door for the next place. So you have to earn his trust and prove you can perform at a level before he will send you into the next place of challenge. When a man or a woman has the right spirit and the right attitude of excellence, there is nothing you cannot do. It's not about what you're qualified to do. No. It's about where you are placed to apply yourself. With the same spirit in a place that is bigger than you in the eyes of men, you will still deliver. Why? If all you get is a place of, that you're comfortable in, that's not a challenge. You're not going to go far. The way you go far in life is that when the limit of your talent is exhausted in a place, the Lord sends you to a place that will challenge you again. And what usually happens, there are inherent talents of God in you that you have never drawn on. Why? You never got to a place where they were required. That's the truth. So it's when people tell you, oh, no, 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 you, you can't go beyond this place. You know, all the education you have, what's that got to do with anything? Your education is a starting point for the places where you can manifest. It just says you have been to school. It teaches you a way to think. 
It teaches you to read. It teaches you a way to engage in a decent environment. It tells you your mind can work. It shows you your brain has capacity. But most people die not using more than a little percentage of the capacity that their brain has. When you move from one season to the next and you're like, okay, Lord, I need help here. The Bible says, they that know their God, they shall be strong and they will do exploits. They knowing their God is trusting their God in terrains that they're not familiar with. Is knowing that their God knows every terrain that they can show up in. Is knowing that he knows and trusting him to walk them through a new terrain they have never been through. And knowing that once they apply themselves diligently with an excellent spirit, everything they need at every stage in that place will manifest. Why? Because in you, there are hidden treasures of God. He will never send you on an assignment or to a place for which he has not prepared you. But our lives are in seasons and stages. And therefore, what you don't need at stage A will not manifest. When you get to stage C, at the beginning, it will look like, ah, A and B, they were easy for me. But this is a little challenging. But as you begin to move, you will find yourself beginning to find your place of comfort. As you are seeking wisdom and you are seeking understanding, even in that place, grace will come. As you diligently apply yourself to the assignment of that place, help will come. As you continue to express yourself and show good faith, you will find yourself becoming comfortable in manifesting and becoming a star, even in that place. And just when you think I'm just about to get the hang of it, God already knows you're done there. And then he moves you to the next place. And then you're wondering, ah, I just about managed to cope here. You will still shine in the next place. It is a daily attitude. It, it, it is an understanding of the fact that whatever you put your hands to do, you must do it well. It is knowing that Jehovah is your helper. It is your ability to completely comprehend that you are never alone. But God will not do for you what you should do by yourself. And God will not manifest himself with a slothful hand. The Bible talks to us about the slothful. They will tend to poverty. But he also talks about the diligent. Ultimately, the diligent man will prosper. Because you see, there's the 10,000 hour rule. Doing what you need to do continuously, consistently over time. What will you become? A master. You will become a master of whatever you do consistently over time. Even if you are the most stupid human being on the face of the earth. Your body will condition and train itself to respond. Why? Because you do it. Take an uneducated man, totally uneducated, and put him in a space to watch you do something every day. And then after a while, allow him to begin to try it out. Over time, he will be better than a graduate of that field. Why? Because of application of self, consistently, diligently. So whatever it is that you want to do, to be excellent in it is not that difficult. 
First, you must want it. There must be a desire to be an excellent person. You must make a personal decision. In this place, I want to be an outstanding staff. In my field, I want to be the best in furniture manufacturing. As a banker, in investment banking, I want to be the best in debt solution. You need some clarity. Sometimes your, what you think is clear is not so clear, but you must define something that serves as a guide. And as you start on that journey, because that then forces you to seek the right kind of knowledge or skills for the area you have then identified that you, Ibukunlu Awashika, have chosen to be best at. And you must have the capacity to set distractions aside because there will always be distractions competing for your focus in the place you have chosen to want to. Because you see, you can get easily distracted. I want to be the best at debt solution. Then all of a sudden, somebody says, ah, this other bank is um, recruiting people in another field and they pay more. And you say, ah, better let me go and take this. Is money your goal? Or the debt solution specialist your goal? Because ultimately, when you become the specialist in debt solution, you will make the money. Because there will be few experts in the field. And that commands price. So you have a decision to make. And God is not the one that will make that decision for you. You will pray about it and ask God for guidance in terms of the areas that hold the best for your future that you cannot see. If it's between A and B, you can ask the Lord for guidance. But you will make some level of decision and you will focus on enhancing and equipping yourself in that area. So first, you must decide you want to be excellent. Two, you must narrow, identify the areas that you believe that you want to build in. Three, you must decide what are the things that will enhance my ability to be excellent in that place. Are there additional courses that I need? Do I still need to go to school? Who is, I remember one day one young man, one of my friend's son, called me and said, Auntie, please, I want to intern with a particular specific person. So I'm like, why? He said, because I want to learn what he <laughs> He's the best at this thing in this field. And I just want to work under him so I can learn before I go to business school. That's a focused young man. And doing his own, he had done his research. He didn't come to me to say, Auntie, who do you think can help me with this? No. It was easier to help a man who had already done his work. He'd done the work. He knew who had what talents in the field and zeroed in on who had the most talent that could offer him and then sought for help to connect him to him. That was easy because he'd done the work. So I could easily call the person and say, Oga, this one is my son. He wants to learn from you for your field. And he says, okay, ma. I'll take him on. And he did. And when he felt he had learned enough, he knew that to enhance himself even better, he should go to business school. He resigned from what was a good job to go to business school as part of his plan to equip himself to be excellent in an identified field. So yes, you must also identify people that can add value to you in your desire to be excellent in that particular thing. So when you're talking about mentoring, it's not just for show. It's not just for big names. And sometimes the people you need, they don't need any big name. You just need someone that knows what you know. 
that knows what you need to know. I want to build the biggest shirt brand. Am I going to TM Louis or any of those people? Will they even take me? No. But there's a 60 something year old tailor down in Ebute Meta that has been making shirts for 30 years. Yes. He understands how to make, what's the most difficult thing with a shirt? Collar and cuff. That's what it is. And if you go to TM Lewin or any of the biggest brands for shirts, you don't even know the name of the guys who make it. Yes. They're ordinary, illiterate, skilled men. But who have done that same thing usually for years. It's like you going to a factory in Italy or going to a Swiss watch factory. The guy who places the most correct chronometer or whatever, whatever, he's probably like 70 years old. He's been doing it for generations. The efficiency he can achieve based on everything he has learned in his 10,000 hour rule is what qualifies him for the highest pay even more than the administrative people that are graduates, because he's more difficult to replace than the sales and marketing manager. Because those ones, they're 10,000 for a dime. There are too many of them. You can always find one to choose. But the guy with that skill needs to have lived for another 50 years before and to have been doing that same thing. When you are dedicated to your skill and you seek excellence in your identified area, you will be paid, I promise you. There is no way that you ultimately don't get paid. There would be times and seasons it will seem like you are at the disadvantage. People running around, around you will seem like they're making money faster than you. Don't ever despair. When you're a child of God who understands purpose and who knows you're on, a, on an assignment and that your life counts for something and that in standing out as an example, manifesting excellence wherever you find yourself, that you are preaching the gospel. This is the truth. If your life isn't preaching, you're not living. At least you're not living for Christ. That's the truth. So if you think you go to work just so you can make money and all of that, you've missed it. Every minute of your life belongs to God. The entirety of your life is ministry. Every action that you take every day is at work for Christ. Where is Christ in what you do? Does that mean we should all just come to church and sit that well? She's my colleague at First Bank. So I know that she doesn't sit at church from morning till night. Pastor definitely looks the professional that he is. So they are not just coming to sit down. So you cannot just say, ah, okay, for me to serve God, all I have to do is come to church from morning till night. Which God are you serving? God left you and I behind for the purpose of who? Of the world. Where is the world found? Everywhere, in the workplace, in the hospital, on the buses, as a doctor, in the doctor's office, as a lawyer, when people come with their cases, as a nurse helping somebody, as a builder, as a contractor, as whatever. You're in the ministry of people. And the way you conduct yourself with those people is how you preach Christ every day. The question is, if you're not doing that daily in an excellent manner, who are you representing? Because if the God that we serve is a God of excellence and seeks that we will manifest his spirit in everything that we do, then we don't have a choice. So you must know you must walk through those spaces and allow things to work 
for you. Money is not your driver. Money is the fruit of doing what you do excellently. Whenever you do what you do excellently, you will ultimately be paid. Just remember that. You will ultimately be paid. In all the years when all I sought to do with my business, I believe I shared with you the last time I came here, I just wanted to build a business with certain value system. That's, I started my business with that as the purpose. After youth service, I'd worked in a furniture company for three and a half months. That showed me I did love the furniture manufacturing, but I hated their value system. And I thought I can do this and do it with the right values. And that was my driving force. I wasn't even a Christian. It was just based on my upbringing and the way I saw life. But God knew I would need full understanding of him and his grace. So I became a Christian within a year of starting my journey of entrepreneurship. As I got started in that, it became clear that those things would cost me many other ways, but I stuck to it. But as I did, others were watching. And I didn't realize. It seemed slower. It seemed like it took much longer. It seemed like people were making the kind of money I should be making for the skills I had. But I was making less for the values that I had. That's what it seemed like for a while. And then a tipping point came. And I got my reward. Or I started receiving my reward. Because as my younger sister put it, at a point of one of my appointments, she said to me, you know, all your competitors or your colleagues in your industry who did so many things you refused to do, all they probably made then was money, and the money is long gone, and some of those businesses are dead. And I used to think that Allah shade you need, because why would you insist on doing things this difficult way? It's as if you always chose to make your life more difficult. But now I see that truly, God is a rewarder. So the same things that were considered as my disadvantage for staying true to doing things right became my advantage that has brought me to the places where I sit right now. So that's what I'm saying to you. If you stay true to your vision and you're diligent and excellent with it, and your values are consistent, and your commitment is to glorify God, you will be paid. I guarantee you. And you will be paid exceedingly and abundantly above all you could ever imagine or dream of. I couldn't imagine some of the places where I sit. There was nothing to tell me that I would get here. I knew I would go far in life because I was determined to make something of my life. But even that is hard to define in the light of some of the places where I have found myself. Do we still have time for this interactive session? Okay, all right. Before I scatter your whole conference agenda, <laughs> let's have this interactive part. Who wants to ask me the first question? Okay. 
Can I have a mic for him? No, it's the gentleman in the suit behind. He's got his hand up. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Actually, I'm a senior account officer of one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in Nigeria, in, in the heart of Ikeja here. So actually, I go to office, I've been working for some years now. I go to office each day, and uh, I sit in the, in the comfort of the AC and so on, and each time I ask myself, what am I doing here? Because what I really have passion for is evangelism. To go out, each time I'm, coming, I'm going to work, and I, in the morning I pass through Ogba where I stay, I see some people standing on the junction, they are evangelizing. And I always admire these people a lot. And each time I go to my office, I work with the computer and so on, and something tells me, what am I doing here? I don't know, I don't belong here. So actually, I don't know how to go about it, because I need to work so I can pay my bills, pay my house rent, and other things. So but what I really love to do is to do what I have passion for as a person. Though I do it, because each time I'm going to work, if I enter the bus or a camera, I, I evangelize. I do minister. If I'm coming back from work, I do the same thing. But I want to really go on a full-time basis, you know, since it's what I really have passion for. That's what I long to do. So I don't know what... Uh... It's a good question, but he's asking the perfect person. I'll explain the answer to him. Second question. Okay. I'll, I'll take a number of questions together and try and answer them. We'll be more efficient for time. Good afternoon, Ma. And thank you so much for the message thus far. I'm a scriptwriter, so um, I have this burden because there was a time when. Um, I had to lead a group of scriptwriters for a particular TV show. So I have this particular guy that is very stubborn. He's been stubborn through the conference and everything. So it came to the time when we needed to write the script. And I have control over the pay. So there was this job he was supposed to do that he refused to do it. And I called his attention to it and said, young man, go do it. And it felt like I was too forceful. I was being too forceful. Actually, the word they used, bossy. And um, at that point in time, I felt like I was on my right to demand that he does the job. Up to this moment, he has not done the job. Is he a Christian? He claims to be a Christian. <laughs> okay, go on. There's a reason I asked. I will explain myself, but go on. Up to this moment, he has not done the job. Now, I know the pay will come very soon. Now, this is what I decided. I decided that since you're not going to do the job, I will allocate the job to some persons I probably will take more of the job because I need the money. So <laughs> I will, I will take more of the job and divert the funds to the people that do the job. But at the same time, I'm thinking that, um, don't you think you should talk to him? But this guy insulted me. He felt it is very unreasonable from what I see. So at this point, I'm actually in that dilemma of, should I, I could do the job for free, like do the job and pay him the money anyways. But I felt like at this point in time, should I not stand my ground and say, young man, are you the employer of the young man? I am the head writer, so they pay the money through me. Okay. To pay but you don't them. employ him, so no. you don't have the power to fire him? No, I don't. Okay. All right, third question. Girls, show up. <laughs> okay, there's a woman there in green. See, I'm a diversity person. Thank you so much, Ma, for the wisdom that you've shared this morning. Um, my question is, is it possible for one's passion, I don't know how to explain it now, I'm a fashion designer. I love, that is what I love doing. I love doing it. But a lot of people around think, I know I have um, a skill when it comes to public speaking. A lot of people are, I'm actually under pressure right now to go for further training and probably take up career in um, a career that will put me out there, that will be able to talk to people, reach more people. And I know I have the gift. I know I can do it, but I don't, it doesn't come, it doesn't, I don't see myself doing it, even though I know I have the gift. Okay. 
you know, many people have an opinion about who you should be. Many people have an opinion about how you should live. Many people want to instruct your life. But there's only one God in your life. And the person who has the best communication with him about your life is you. Never forget that. So opinions are good. Counsel is safe. But every counsel is information. It is not instruction. So when people tell you their opinion, all it does is it gives you a 360 degree view of the situation. But the decision is entirely yours based on what you know between your heart desire, your God instructed passion and instruction, and where you feel led. And sometimes it would become clearer by where the opportunities around you at that point lie. Do you understand what I'm saying? So you might have the gift to speak, but does that mean public speaker of what? This is how people confuse people and throw them away. You've already stated your passion is fashion. It's obvious from just looking at you. The way you've put your gab together, it shows there's attention to detail. Who says your speaking does not align with your fashion? So your gift will be used to sell your business. But in addition, you're a child of God. Who says your gift will not be used in the house of God? Children's fellowship, youth fellowship, business fellowship, whatever. And some of the gifts we have, they're timed. When the time and the season for which you have the gift comes, you will not have to push it. It will come naturally and you will get a voice and a means of expression. Because it's not about being able to speak. It's about speaking what to what. When I was at school, I used to debate. Throughout Methodist Girls High School, I used to debate for the school. I won the Lagos State Best Speakers Contest and all of that. So for that, people thought I would make a great lawyer. Even though I went to university to study chemistry, even at a point, after my first year, I wanted to abandon my chemistry and change to law until I caught myself and decided I didn't want to be a lawyer. And then I went ahead and decided I wanted to be an accountant so I could work in a bank. But I finished my chemistry anyway, took a lot of electives in accounting, went to serve in Akintola Williams, which is now Deloitte. And then by the end of the one year of the service, I realized I didn't love accounting. But I thought well, I would still like to work in a bank, but let me take any job I could find first. And that first job was in a furniture company to kill time. I spent only three and a half months there and ended up starting my own company. This January is 30 years since I've built that company. <laughs> now, no, I haven't finished my story. See that debating and that speaking. What did I think it was for? For some, it was to make me a lawyer. Did they prove to be true? No. What has it turned out to be for? No. The gospel. Because I was even a Muslim all of those years we were talking about. Yes. I was born and bred a Muslim. My name is Belkisu. So when I became a Christian, did I even go to church and start preaching? No. I became a Christian four months to my wedding. And in church, I listened, I learned. Somehow my pastor said, the Lord said, you should start a business fellowship. I was still a young business person. I was 30 or 29 or something. So I started the business fellowship in Fountain just as we started. What was I going to teach them? The little I had learned in my few years of business. And that's how it started. And then between Pastor Taiwan and Pastor Bimbo, 
they wouldn't let me rest about the fact that the things I was teaching in church were meant for the larger body. And I refused. Why? Because I said, I love my privacy. Until Pastor Bimbo told me one day, hmm, mediocres will stand and they will say nonsense and they will own the space that the Lord has assigned to you because you have refused to step out. That's when I went ahead and I started Businesses Way, the TV program. I'm giving you a story so you can learn for all of you. Because for every one question, there are 10,000 other people. And that's how I found my voice. First, through TV, with Businesses Way, the TV program. And then that then made it difficult for me to sit behind anymore. And I started then sharing in church. Because you know what? The business ministry is difficult for most everyday pastors to preach. Because business people go to them with business issues that the pastor has never experienced before. He's going to come at it from a spiritual matter. doesn't solve the problem. That's the truth. Because you need understanding of the field to apply the scriptures to it and bring life. So, you have a voice. God doesn't give a gift that will be wasted. Continue to use it anyhow you find as long as it glorifies God for now. When the time and the season comes, it will find its own space. But follow your passion and don't be deceived. I've seen too many people abandon careers for the gospel, in inverted commas, and they suffer because of lack of understanding. Every single child of God has a responsibility to preach the gospel. Every single one of us. Will we all preach from the platform? No. Will we all preach in the street corners? No. But we will all preach it. And that's why I said to you, being excellent is a way of representing God. Because you're preaching every way in everything that you do. There's a reason God has allowed you to come to where you are. And evangelizing. There are people that you cannot speak to on the street corner. The people you meet in those offices every day. The people you meet in the course of that work. They too, they need evangelism. Beyond that, most churches have evangelism programs. If you know it's a passion for you, there's nothing that says you're not active in the evangelism department. And if you don't have one yet in your church, maybe it's you that will get your pastor to get it started because you and some other people might have a definite passion for it, which means your weekends and your leave and public holidays are spent reaching out for God. And if there's more to that at a stage, the Lord will set you up in a way that you will not starve. He's not a God that puts you to shame. So, there's a lot of confusion about people do these things and it puts a lot of people off. I work with missionaries. I've worked with missionaries for the last 24 years. I run an organization called Christian Missionary Fund, which is what Pastor was talking about. So, I'm leaving my full corporate entrepreneurial life, but I am actively involved in the work of God. I'm here today, but beyond that, I work with hundreds of missions scattered across this nation. I have a full office and a full ministry, people working there full time, some of whom have worked there for 24, 25 years, full time, reaching missionaries. And one of our flagship events is the one he came to. I have a ball every year, a large ball for about 700, 800 people. It's called the Jesus Ball. It's grand and everything. The whole idea is to show that when it's Christ, it doesn't have to be shoddy. So we have an opulent ball. And you don't buy a ticket. You get invited. So you don't think that it's because you've bought a ticket. No. Just come. You will be entertained. You will be inspired. But you will hear the stories of the missionaries. And then let the Lord speak to you to get involved in supporting missionaries. And I've been doing that every year for 20-something years. So... Can you do the work of ministry 
and still be an excellent accountant? Yes, you can. And if there's a point in your life that the Lord requires that you will be full-time in ministry, you will know. You will not be struggling. You will find your peace and you would walk into it. How many people have watched God calling? Okay. Yeah, each other hasn't watched God calling. God calling is the movie that I'm executive producer of. It's a faith-based movie and it's showing in the cinemas right now. It's been showing in the cinemas since December. But I say it myself with no apologies. It's an excellent movie. It is not what people expect that Christians will bring out. But my goal when I agreed to work with these young men that had the ideas was my reason for deciding to be executive producer and to invest in making the movie was to find contemporary means of preaching the gospel. And everybody goes to watch it and they're like, ah, this is a Christian movie. Because as far as we've gotten feedbacks shown in America, it's showing... It's showing our goal is to take it around the world. So, some of those things, if I don't have the resources or the opportunities that I have, I can't deliver them. So there's nothing wrong with us as Christians sitting in high places. We can still preach the gospel. So don't let the devil deceive you and keep everybody out on the street begging for money to eat before we can preach. No. You must preach with your life, with your words, and with your actions every day. And those that are called, my pastor, Pastor what you call it, is a petroleum engineer. When we started Fountain, he was working in NMPC. He refused to leave for a long time because I cannot be coming to church to beg for money to feed my wife and my children. But when he got to a point, he knew that it was time to leave. And the church could afford to pay him at least the salary they were paying him at an MPC. And then he pulled out. And the work has proven itself because time has told the story. So for every man and every woman, we have different calling. But don't run ahead of yourself. Thank you. Did I miss? You know, a lot of people use... You know when I talked about emotions and stuff... I find it a challenge in church. As leaders, as employers, as employees, we confuse things. If a man is paid for a job and doesn't do it, it's not compassionate for me to tolerate him. That's the truth. Because he will destroy my work, which I am accountable to God for. If a man doesn't do his work, and I have a word with him, and I encourage him, and he doesn't do it, I will fire him and I will not think twice because what I should do in love, I have done. And as a laborer is worthy of his wages, me as the employer as well, I deserve value for the work that I pay for, for which I am accountable to God. So, if a man works for you who doesn't do the work, it's not Christiany to pay him for what he hasn't done. For what? Because we tolerate a lot of stuff. And there's a lot of mediocrity in the church. And a lot of Christians are also like that. You work in a place, you don't deliver value. And then you are praying against your boss not paying you. You should never be paid. Period. And you shouldn't, if you ask me to come and help you beg somebody when you didn't do what you should do, I will not even answer you. This is the truth. Because... How do you show excellency of Christ in the place that you work? Is that you're excellent at your job? How do you as an employer show the excellency of Christ? Is that you're just, you're fair, and you're equitable with your workers. You pay a fair wage for fair work. You're kind and you're conscientious in keeping your word to your workers. But you will demand service and deliverables. And if they don't, I will you will take the right action. And that's why companies must structure. You should have terms of every contract. You should have conditions of service. So that when people breach it, you have something to refer to. And you will do it kindly. So you write a man a nice letter. 
have an interview with him and explain why you are firing him. But you fire him anyway. And you pay him what is due. And he goes so that he doesn't destroy your work. So whatever you need to do, don't apologize for taking the right action. Uh, I think I, I've used all the time I have. I'm happy to, if you are happy. No problem. Any more questions you want me to deal with? Okay. It's a lady first now. Two ladies. I'm not uh, partial. Okay, the two ladies and the gentlemen. Sir, if you permit me, I'll add the gentleman, and I'll take all of them in one go. It's really why I try to do this, because people always leave with questions. But unfortunately, I didn't come early enough to maximize time. Good morning, Ma. Thank morning. you so much for all you said. You're welcome. One thing um, about you that has always remained a mystery to me is how do you balance everything? Standard question of my life. Okay. Basically, that, that, for me, that is what I want to know. You are excellent as a family woman. You are excellent as a, a minister. And then you are excellent in your career. How do you do it? And your spiritual life is on point. How do you do it? <laughs> okay. Next question. Okay. Good afternoon, Ma. Um, I want to. I listened to you about two years ago when you appeared for Global Leadership. Can you use your mic? Uh, yeah. I listened to you about two years ago when you um, up, um, came for Leadership um, Global Leadership Summit, and you recommended a book, uh, Business Business by the Book. I think by Larry Bucket. I had to search for that book and I got it. Ma, yes, ma. ma. My question is, do you think all the facts you wrote there, they are applicable here? And secondly, ma, I know you also gave some examples during the summit, all the challenges you went through when you were in the um, secular world. Can you please throw more light into that, ma? That's a whole summer. But third question. <laughs> Good afternoon, ma'am. My name yes, is sir. Paul Otupe. Um, my question is this. Uh, um, in, I know in the Bible, um, the Bible said that a, new, a good name is better than precious ointment. Um, I believe it's not talking about uh, a literal name, right? Uh, my question is this. How? It's actually literary. Uh, OK, OK, ma'am. It just means that preserve your name rather than make money when you're okay. faced with it. Oh, it's okay, giving you options. That's what, anyway, we'll get to it. All right, ma. Okay, my question is this. Um, what, what bearing does our name have on uh, us fulfilling our destiny? Or rather, okay. is, uh, for, like for some people who are not uh, born into a Christian home, along, somewhere along the line, they have to change their name. Or, you know... Okay, that's, I understand your question. But question. you see, what the Bible is saying there is not that my name is Ibuku and your name is uh, uh, Paul. Did I get you right? Yes, ma'am. Yes. It's, it's your integrity. It's your character. It's your reputation. That's, yeah. what, that's what it means by name. Okay. Because Ibuku Awashika, what does it mean? It's just some uh, alphabets put together that you can read one way. But what's his real meaning? is that when that name is said, what does it communicate to you? That's what a name is. That if you say, um, what, the guy that was kidnapping everybody all over the place. When they say Evans, what does it mean to you? No, no, it's true. So if I say Tinubu, what does it mean to you? Power. No, no, but that's really what it is. If I say Jesus, what does it mean to you? So if I say Ibukun, what, do you, what does it mean to you? So really, that's what it means. Your name, what does it communicate? What is the messaging that the name represents based on how you've lived your life? Based on your character, 
based on your integrity, based on your word. That's really what it is. Which is why you have to live your life deliberately. You have to live your life consciously. You have to understand that everything you do every day, every minute has implication for your name. It has impl implication for your legacy. Your children will pay the price of it for good or for evil. Because if Evans children dare to say anywhere they're Evans children, what do you think will happen? So for sure they would have changed their name. Why? Because that name no longer becomes bearable. Because it represents evil. Have you seen anybody name their child Satan? Issue. So frankly, it's really about everything we've been talking about since morning. You build your name based on the way you live your life. Based on your expression of day by day, the things you do. That becomes synonymous with what your name is recognized to represent. And the biggest part for us as Christians, because we're children of God, the way we live becomes synonymous with who Christians are. It's why you will get to some place and mm, I don't want all these Christians. Oh. Why? Because enough of us have misrepresented us and the way they have lived and the things they have done that we have become distasteful to people. There are people that will not employ Christians. True or false? Why? Because you go to work and you'll be reading Bible when you should be working. Why? There's a time to read your Bible. There's a time to pray. When you're at work, from 8 to 5, you work for the man that pays you. That's what the Bible says. When you have your lunch break, 12 to 1, 1 to 2, wherever it is, you can go to the toilet or anywhere you want and read your Bible. That's fine. But don't go to work and think that just because you want to pray between 9 and 10, or you want to pray between 2 and 3 when you should be at work, it should be acceptable. Of course not. You must deliver value for which the man has paid you. Show him that as a Christian, you will do what you are paid to do and you can be trusted to do that. Those are some of the things that we have assumed wrongly and we must understand it. If you really live excellently, you must be living excellently for Christ in every way because everything that you do counts. Now, it's the lady that asked me the question there. That was Larry Bucket. Okay, is it possible to apply those things here? You know, my entire business career of building business God's way, which led to my TV program and the book, Business His Way, was from, as you heard in the global leadership video, my first contact with the fact that you could build your business after God as a pattern was from reading Larry Buckets and one guy, Sam Something, who wrote a book that said, God owns my business. Those were the two books that I read that got me started. And then I thought, oh, I can do this too. I want God to own my business. But if God owns a business, I cannot be paying bribe in the business. I cannot be stealing. I cannot be doing there are many things I can't do because that will not be God. And that's what started me on the journey of building a business uh, group based on certain uh, Christian values. Now, are those things applicable here? They're applicable anywhere. You know, the thing is, the world says to us, some things cannot be done. But if the Bible says it's the right thing for us to do, then we can do it. What is the real challenge? It's the sacrifice. The price we need to pay in order to keep to those things. Now, the question you will then ask is, can you succeed here if you do those things? I dare to say with all sense of humility that if my business has continued to exist for 30 years, from the point at which I encountered that and I sought to do it, it's a living proof that you can. Now, will you have difficult times sometimes because of that? Yes. Will sometimes things be difficult for you? Remember earlier I was talking about the fact that no matter what price you pay, at the end of the day, you will get your, you will be paid. It means, like when my sister said, I shade you, um, I like shade you, for those that don't speak Yoruba, that I can overdo. 
Overdue was simply because I had those principles you were talking about and I refused to do certain things. At a point, furniture, to bring furniture into Nigeria was 100% duty. Nobody would pay it, but I did. And it seemed like madness. Even my staff used to think I was insane. But I knew that I could not in one hand face God and another hand turn against him. I had to be able to follow him all the way. And I had my serious moments of trials and tests. But at every one of those moments, painful as they were, God saw me through. And the places where I stand right now, they're my reward. That's the truth. They are my reward. Because when my peers were making the kind of money that I knew I was more than qualified to do, when I watched people that couldn't do half, deliver half the quality of what I could, walk away with the biggest projects and the highest amounts, or people that would get it and would have to come to me to be able to do it, for peanuts compared to what they were being paid. I would cry out to God, but I refused to betray him. And I decided to stay with him. You know, you must be willing to die for God, even if he doesn't show up. But you know the funny thing? Every time God knows you're willing to die for him, even if he doesn't show up, you wouldn't have to die at all. That's the truth. You will not have to die at all. Remember the Bible talks about the heroes of faith. And he listed men that believed but never received. He put it there for us to know. That sometimes we're going to believe him and we will not receive. But what I've learned in my 30 years in business. Is that even when we walk through those moments. God is using it to fine tune us. And to pre prepare us for things. Every board place where I sit, I sit as an ambassador of integrity. I was called for that skill, for that particular character, which God taught me and made visible to others through those things in that book. They were tough, but they were true. I was slower than my peers, it seemed. But when I got to my tipping point, when the Lord knew that he could trust me, he became truly my glory and the lifter of my head. And it just, it was like, as we got to that point, every year, back to back, I moved from one appointment to the other. Every single year, I contracted it for you. And not a single one that I sought, not a single place that I knew who even led to it. From 2009, when I just got a random call that some people wanted to come and see me, and it turned out to be a team, two or two men representing Cadbury International, who then came to my house, sat with me for two and a half hours. And at the end of that, I was appointed to the board of Cadbury, where I've sat since 2009 till today. The next year, 2010, I thought, after a conversation, I was being appointed to chair the insurance company that the first bank group was starting in joint venture with Salam. But then a month after, I, I didn't know that I had to join the board of First Bank in order to chair the board of their insurance company. And so a month after, I got an invitation saying I've been appointed to the board of First Bank. From where to where? And six months after, I was then appointed to still chair the insurance company. Two years after that, that was now, we're now 2011. 2011, Chair of uh, Insurance. 2012, I was appointed to the Sovereign Wealth Fund Board. By 2013, the group took me from being the chair of the insurance company because we had become successful in two years, instead of five years as they planned, to become chair of FBN Capital, which was the investment bank. Within two years, we bought Kakawa Discountant and they asked me to double chair. By 2015, we combined the two together to form the Merchant Bank. And I was the first chair of the Merchant Bank. And September 2015, the announcement was made that I'd been appointed as chair of First Bank, effective 1st of January 2016. I have since had multiple appointments in between all of that and that both internationally and locally. Look, God owes no man. His ways seem tough. The devil tells you it's difficult to follow God. It's a lie. 
God will test your heart and he will test your hands. And more importantly, because money is the greatest evil of men. It's the easiest place to draw men to evil, even though money itself is not evil. But if you're willing to follow God every step of the way, even in matters that relate to finances and business, he will place you in places you cannot imagine. So this is my story. It's not, my father is not some great man who has bought shares everywhere. I've heard it some, in some places, oh, it's because I was born with golden spoon. I don't know what that is. Come from a middle class family. My family lives in Surulere. I went to good schools, but everybody could go to good school in my generation if your parents were professionals. Middle class families invested all their money in sending their kids to school and they teach you values. The rest of it, I had to stuck to following God and his ways. And he made it profitable for me. So, can you do it? The word of God fits every country of the world. And it works perfectly. What is the formula? There's no formula. You know, one thing that I will tell you, don't judge your life by any other person's life. Because you see, from the outside, if you're not on the inside, you can't tell how perfect other people's lives are. So don't. That's first lesson. Not because there's something wrong with my life, but because I realize that when you look at Instagram and all of those things, a lot of people put themselves under pressure trying to live the life of other people. And there are many people you see that even looking at the picture they've posted and knowing them, they're creating a false posture. So don't get carried away by that. What is your business? Your life. What is your business? Your own calling and your goals. What is your business? Your God and what he has called you to do. And how do you fulfill it to the best of your ability? What do I seek to do? To serve my master the best that I know how. To die, to live my life and die totally empty. Without any talent or ability that I have that I have not used for the purpose of God. This is the race I'm running, and it's, it's one man race. I race against no one. I compete with no one. So if God has helped me to bring it all together, it's because I trust him every day. The days I get it right and the days I get it wrong, I still lean on him and ask him for help, but I don't lose sight of what my goal is. I'm blessed with some key things in my life. A good husband, that's an asset. So for those of you that are young and are single, don't be stupid. Don't marry a fool. Don't marry a guy just because he's the best singer in church. Apologies to the choir. <laughs> or don't marry a girl because she's always on stage, so she looks attractive. That's not what you need. You need to find the woman or the man that the Lord has called to you who will have the capacity to handle the purpose of God in your life. That is key because of all the things that make my life work is that I'm married to a great guy who, has, who is self-assured and confident enough to accommodate the call of God in my life and who has the capacity to enable and to allow me live my life. But you know, that also takes two sides. I also have the wisdom not to fight with the word of God that says I should submit to my husband. Now, what does it mean? It just means that whether I like it or not, every ship has a captain. And the captain of the ship of my family is my husband. Does that mean I do not have an opinion? If you live in a married home, you know that the woman drives the ship in many ways. Men know that. They will tell you the truth. A soft power effectively used. That's just the truth. What I say to women is, know where you're going. Know what you want. Don't care what any other woman tells you outside about her own friend, her husband, how she does it. That's her own the pair of you and your husband is a unique pair. Always different from another pair. So somebody else's formula is not your formula. 
Your formula is your own formula, and you must formulate what works for the two of you. Most people are comfortable developing a business strategy. There's no person that has a business that doesn't spend time developing strategy for the year, strategy for the season. How many times have you sat down to develop your life strategy? And the strategy to make your home work so that it can support your business ambition or your career ambition and your ambition where your children are concerned. In doing that, you will know the things you must do the things you mustn't do, and how you must do some things in order to be able to achieve the things you want to do. It's one couple at a time. Self-developed strategy that works for you. Don't get carried away with anybody else's story. Just face your own and make sure that this pair is working. Whatever makes it work, you're deaf to everybody else's opinion, and you can run. That's what I do. My children, they belong to the Lord. They're not mine. I'm the only girl in our house. I have three sons and a husband. But I know that every day from pregnancy, I've been committing them to the Lord. And every day, I pray for them. It's a difficult generation to raise children right now, especially in the midst of plenty. You need God. You need grace. So, you stay with it and you stay before God and stay sincerely with your goal for your family and apply yourself the best way that you can, having mutual respect for one another and understanding that the best of you can only support the best of him. And a foolish man is the one that keeps his wife down because what he will get in the day of help is a foolish woman that he has kept down. And if the Bible says your wife is your helper, and you have not allowed your wife to be the best of herself, you will not get the best help. You will get foolish help from a foolish kept down woman. And that will not serve your purpose. So it's understanding on both sides. It takes two. Only one pair of two. One set. Woman and man. Specific. Biodu and Ibuku Awashika. That's one pair. How does this pair work? We work it out. Hmm? God bless you guys. Thank you for being a part of our broadcast. You know, we never like to end without giving you an opportunity to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. Coming into Christ is beyond joining a church, is beyond a religion. It is joining God's family. And that is done when you believe in Christ Jesus. So I just want to lead you right away now. If you, are, if you want to give your heart to Christ, just say after me, say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you died and rose again and that you paid for my sins. I accept you as my Lord and my Savior, and from today I belong to you. If you have said those words, we'll be late, you are born again, you are part of God's family right now, you can go ahead and rejoice about it. And if you want to contact us, just check the addresses written on the screen. God bless you. We love you. Stay blessed.